So I'm Ralph Budd. I'm director of the Vermont Center for Immunology and Infectious Diseases. And joining me tonight is Bradley Tompkins from the Department of Health and Molly Markovitz from the Larner School of Medicine, one of our own medical students. And we're going to be talking to you about Lyme disease in part because Vermont has the distinction of being the state with one of the highest, if not the highest, incidence of Lyme disease per capita in the nation. And so we'll be talking to you about what is this disease, what causes it, how do we diagnose it, how do we treat it, what does it look like, a little bit about the research that we're doing here at UVM on it, and then at the end, what we know and what we don't know about what is chronic Lyme disease. And so our two protagonists in this story are these two right here. On the left is the black-legged tick, Ixiotes scapularis, and on the right is the spirochete Borrelia burgdorferi, a distant cousin of the same spirochete that causes syphilis. And these two live together, and they also share a host cycle that Brad and Molly will probably talk to you more about. Uh, that is primarily in rodents and in deer. They go through this various life cycle. And what I just want to point out here is that we humans and our pets are not part of this normal life cycle, okay? So when Borrelia hops out and gets into us, it's no happier about doing that than we are to have it in us. We are not the normal host of this. And so when that happens, as is many pathogens, when they jump species into a new species, a lot of inflammation can result. We could replace this with Ebola virus and put bats in there. Uh, and bats, which are the normal carrier of Ebola, do not get bothered by it. But when it hops species and gets into humans, it can cause a lot of pathogenesis. So that's the main point I want to make. We are not the normal hosts, and they are not happy to be in us. And so when a tick lights on us, as you'll see in some of the pictures that Brad and Molly have to show, is it begins to feed. It takes a blood meal once a year. And that blood meal may have Borrelia in it, but if they already have Borrelia in them, in their gut, okay, the blood coming in causes a change in the environment in the gut where the Borrelia reside. The temperature goes up, nutrients come in with the blood, the pH changes, and this causes the Borrelia to undergo a change. It's like a chameleon. It, changes, it sheds its coat, it changes its proteins, and it does this so it can migrate from the gut into the salivary gland, okay? And it changes these outer surface proteins. We'll talk a little about, about these a little bit later. We use them diagnostically. But these outer surface proteins, A, B, and C, and there's more of them, they change as it migrates from the gut to the salivary gland. And this takes time. And the point to make is that during this transit time while it's feeding on you, you've got time to get the tick off before it's in the salivary glands, because that's when it's going to transmit Borrelia to you. So there's a big lag time here when you can get the tick off of you. Okay, but we'll talk more about this in a little bit later. Okay? Symptoms, okay? The typical symptoms that occur within a short period of time, anywhere from days to a week or so, is often a flu symptom, very nonspecific sort of system, symptoms, aches and pains, fevers that come and go. And then a certain proportion of patients, up to 60 or 70 percent, will develop this typical rash. And the typical rash is this bullseye rash you see where the the tick had fed on you here in the center. And then as the spirochetes migrate out through the skin, you get this erythema, this redness in the skin. So this is the typical bullseye rash. But you can get variations on that. You can have a complete redness. You can have some blue haziness within these red lesions. They can be blistering lesions. And sometimes they can be disseminated. You can get lots of these on you. And then there's patients that have Lyme disease and get none of this. They have no record of a, a rash whatsoever. The thing that we see often, I see as a rheumatologist, is the arthritis. So a small proportion of patients will develop an arthritis. It's typically asymmetric. It'll be one knee or the other knee. It's typically large joints. Knees are a very common place to get this. And these are two individuals here, the swollen knee and the normal knee, and the same thing over here. Another thing that they may get is heart block. And this heart block is due to the fact that the inflammation that Borrelia causes is a very localized one in the heart. It's right in the conduction system, right up in this area here. And so the inflammation that occurs here can block the conduction of the impulse, the electrical impulse that drives the heart from the atrium to the ventricles. So if it's minor, 
you may get what we call first degree block, where the, the pulse gets through, but it's slow. And then if it gets more severe, sometimes these pulses don't get through, and so you get a, a beat and you don't get a contraction of the heart. And sometimes it can be so complete that the impulse doesn't get through at all, and the ventricle engages its own backup pump to do this, and so you get third degree block. So we can see any of these. Fortunately, it's usually transient. It goes away within a couple of weeks, even without treatment sometimes. Um, but that's something that we can see. Another is facial palsy. It can be bilateral. It's one of the causes of bilateral facial palsy. And again, this is generally, fortunately, transient. And there can be central nervous system involvement, too, has been reported. Okay, And these can have vague symptoms from cloudy thinking to headaches, um, stiff neck, meningitis type symptoms, a variety of things that can occur. How do we diagnose this? So there's a variety of things we use. The most common one is what we call the ELISA. And the way this is done is you can take an antigen from whatever bacteria you want to assay for, so Borrelia in our case. You can take the entire organism or you can take one of the proteins of it and you can coat a plastic well with this. Okay? Then you, after you block this, you can take the patient's serum and incubate it on top of that, and any antibodies that we may have will bind to that antigen, that surface protein of Borrelia, if they have antibodies <laughs> to be detected. And then you can detect those antibodies with a second reagent, whoops, and you get a colorimetric assay readout, okay? And typically, we look for one of two responses. We can get either an early immunoglobulin M, IgM, or a later immunoglobulin G response, and that's the typical response of the immune system. Early on, you get IgM. Later on, you get IgG, and we can assay for either of those. What this is, it can be, it's sensitive, but they're all false positives because we all have spirochetes in our mouth that are not Borrelia that can give a false positive here. People with a hyperactive immune system with some of our autoimmune diseases <laughs> may have this positive just because of cross-reactivity by accident between Borrelia and some self protein. So those things can give you false positives. So generally when we see a test like this that's positive, we do a secondary test. <coughs> and this is called a Western blot. And the way this works is we take the, the Borrelia organism, we digest it up, grind it up, and then you can separate all the proteins on a gel from the highest molecular weight ones at the top to the lower molecular weight ones at the bottom. And then you can take the patient's serum and incubate it, just like you did with ELISA, incubate it um, on this, and it will bind to the specific proteins from Borrelia. And so what we're looking for here, it gives you specificity. So it can tell you which proteins, okay, are you reacting to. So here are three patients, as an example, A, B, and C patients. Here's someone with acute erythema migrans, the rash. And at that time, what was tested, they had an antibody to one protein, one of the flagella proteins. And as time went on, this resolved, okay? Here's another patient, also had the rash. They have the same antibody, but they have a couple of other antibodies as well, okay? And as time goes on, they develop arthritis, and you can see the developing antibodies to some of these outer surface proteins, okay? So you get more and more of these going on. And here's a third patient that had this and got neurologic involvement that resolved and they got arthritis. And as you can see, as time goes on with the Borrelia infection, you get antibodies to more and more proteins. And so what we're looking for, and this is kind of in cartoon fashion over here, is IgG antibodies to five out of 10 of these Borrelia proteins, or in the acute response, two out of five out of these. That's the criteria for a positive Western blot. And that's how we really make the diagnosis. As for treatment, we can talk about this a little bit more later, but generally antibiotics um, orally are sufficient in most cases for this. Doxycycline is our favorite. There are others that we can use, and they're usually given for a period of about 21 to 28 days. So three to four weeks treatment for this is sufficient in most cases for this. In some cases that are more resistant, sometimes with the arthritis or some of the neurologic involvement, the Bell's palsy, it may require intravenous antibiotics with ceftriaxone for upwards of a month or so, okay? And in most cases, symptoms will resolve on this. Um, there are some refractory ones. I'm gonna come back and talk about that at the end that we can talk about then. 
Now, there's also vaccine, and I think Bradley's going to talk a little bit about this as well. There was a vaccine several years ago that was tried. It actually worked fairly well, but it was withdrawn from the manufacturer because there was concern among some physicians that people were getting reactions to this and actually developing arthritis from the vaccine, so it was pulled from the market. Uh, now there's a new one that's come out called BLA-15 by Valneva. It's on the fast track. It's going into larger clinical trials in this coming year, um, and hopefully that will be out on the market before too long. So that's a vaccine in development. So I'm going to stop there. We'll come back and talk about chronic Lyme disease at the end, but I'm going to turn it over to Bradley, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the epidemiology of the tick in the environment. Cool. Thank you, Dr. Bud. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, I'll probably stay behind the lectern here so I can see what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, I'm here to talk about um, the epidemiology of Lyme disease, specifically here in Vermont. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a number of tick-borne diseases here in the state, um, some more common than others. Lyme disease is, of course, the most common tick-borne disease, not only in Vermont, but in um, most parts of the United States. Um, anaplasmosis is the second most common. There used to be three or four cases a year in Vermont in 2008, and last year we saw over 200 cases for the first time. This year we're um, about 70% through the year, and we've already exceeded last year's maximum. So anaplasmosis is a tick-borne disease that um, we're particularly concerned about and um, paying a lot of attention to at the health department. These other ones like babesiosis and uh, Borrelia miyamotoi and ehrlichiosis are diseases that we see probably a dozen or so cases a year. And the ones at the bottom, spotted fevers, tularemia, Powassan, which has been making a lot of news this year, um, are very rare. We don't have a case of them um, either ever recorded as being transmitted by ticks or uh, we haven't seen them this century. Heartland virus disease at the bottom, we've never had a case of Heartland virus disease here in um, Vermont. It's only been found in people in um, the Midwest, but we know that our cervids, our deer and our moose are carrying antibodies to Heartland virus, so we stick it on here at the bottom. But tonight is, of course, about Lyme disease. And as Dr. Budd was saying, uh, the agent that's responsible for Lyme disease here in Vermont is Borrelia burgdorferi. Now, Lyme disease can be caused by other pathogens in other parts of the country or other parts of the world. Um, for instance, uh, in the upper Midwest, only a couple of years ago, it was discovered that there was a type of Borrelia called Mayoni Mayonii that was causing Lyme disease. Until that point, we thought that Borrelia burgdorferi was the only pathogen that caused Lyme in the United States. And then there are two different types of Borrelia that can cause Lyme disease in Europe and Asia. So just a very brief history of Lyme disease. Um, and when I say Lyme for the rest of the night, I'm talking about Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, it was, of course, discovered in the 1970s in Connecticut in a town um, called Lyme, Connecticut. But the disease is older than the 1970s. Museum specimens going back um, to the 1890s have you know, looked at mammal specimens, and they can find the bacteria there. And then genetic analysis um, just very recently has found that the pathogen was here in North America before the last ice age. So Borrelia burgdorferi has been here in North America for at least the last 20,000 years. Um, and again, as Dr. Budd was saying, the vector for um, Borrelia burgdorferi here in Vermont is the black-legged tick, Ixodes scapularis. And again, these ticks, they feed on small, warm-blooded animals. Um, we call those the hosts. And one important thing to know is that ticks aren't born. They don't hatch out of their eggs with Borrelia burgdorferi. They don't, they're not born with the ability to transmit or um, they're not born with Lyme disease. They actually have to during their first or their second feeding. And it's at that point that they're then capable of transmitting the disease onto another host, um, like for instance, a human being. And ticks get on to people through questing. Um, you'll hear a lot of things out there about ticks falling down on trees, from trees on top of you, or ticks jumping, and they're just physically incapable of doing that sort of thing. 
what they like to do is to get onto a blade of grass or the edge of a leaf and stick their front appendages out and wait for you or a deer to physically brush by them and then they're going to attach onto you and that's how they're gonna get on for their feeding. And this will be really important when Molly's talking about prevention um, because there are some very easy steps that you can do to reduce your risk of even encountering a tick. Um, ticks have to feed for uh, multiple days. One of the other things I work on at the health department is mosquito-borne diseases. And mosquitoes, of course, you often feel it right away, and if you don't get to smack them quickly, they can be off with their meal. Ticks aren't like that. They have to feed for a long period of time in order to get an a um, adequate blood meal. And they're really um, highly evolved pathogen spreaders because they have a number of tools um, in their saliva that allow them to stay attached to us without us ever noticing them. So their saliva contains things like pain and itch way, um, and itch pathway inhibitors. So you never bite. Um, there's got anticoagulants in there so that your blood keeps flowing so they can continue to feed. Their saliva's got vasodilators, so it opens up your blood vessels so they can continue to get blood. Um, they have inhibitors in there that prevent platelets from aggregating, again, to keep the blood flow going. And then they also have these modulators that prevent your wound from healing, so it can have an open wound for multiple days to take that blood meal. Now, um, as for the uh, ticks in Vermont, um, we've collaborated with some colleagues at uh, Linden State College and at the Agency of Agriculture here, and we know that a lot of the ticks in Vermont are carrying diseases. So um, tonight, of course, we're talking about Borrelia burgdorferi, and just about 53% of the ticks that we've tested in Vermont, 2,200 of them, not a small number, but obviously not the whole population, are carrying the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. You can see here that some of the other diseases that are um, less common than Lyme are less common in the tick population, like anaplasmosis, less than 10%, and uh, Babesia, less than 1% of the ticks in Vermont are carrying that. So when you total all of this up, 60% of the black-legged ticks that we've tested in Vermont are carrying at least one pathogen. Now, ticks um, being particularly devious are capable of carrying more than one pathogen at a time, um, and out of this 2,209 uh, ticks that we've tested, about 5% of them are carrying more than one pathogen at the same time. So um, Lyme disease, we're talking about it in terms of it being a vector-borne diseases because ticks are the ones that transmit the disease to us. But at their, at their very essence, these are zoonotic diseases. As Dr. Budd was saying, they spilled over from the wild animal population into the human population. And early on in our, um, when we were coming to understand uh, the cycle of how Lyme disease was transmitted, it was often thought that the white-tailed deer was largely responsible for the abundance or the increasing frequency of Lyme disease. And as such, the tick that was discovered and thought to be responsible for transmitting the tick was called the deer tick. Um, this led to uh, people thinking that you could take action against the deer and somehow uh, prevent the spread or lower the number of Lyme disease cases that would occur in a population. But unfortunately, we've come to find out that white-tailed deer aren't necessarily the main culprit in the um, spread and increasing frequency of Lyme disease, and that the deer tick actually isn't the deer tick. Uh, not to bore you with uh, lots of details, but they thought that they had both a black-legged tick and a deer tick, and they were two separate things. Turns out they're exactly the same species of tick, and we call it the black-legged tick now because um, while it's also scientifically correct to call it that, uh, calling it the deer tick uh, assigns an overabundance of responsibility to the deer, and we think that somehow culling the deer or controlling the deer population is going to um, help us with the issue in Lyme, with Lyme disease, and that's not necessarily true. The competent reservoirs for Borrelia burgdorferi 
in nature are actually small mammals. Um, this here is the white-footed mouse. It's not one that we see that often because it's nocturnal, um, but it's widely abundant here in the northeast of the United States where we have deciduous forests full of lots of mats for them. And then other creatures like the eastern chipmunk, um, the short-tailed shrew and the mast shrew, and even the American robin. All of these animals, uh, small ticks are feeding on them and these are really good at having loads of Borrelia burgdorferi circulating in their blood so that a tick that doesn't have the disease can then pick it up and subsequently transmit it to us or to somebody else. So these are really the reservoirs that we're concerned about for Lyme and some of the, these other tick-borne diseases. And of course, ticks and these animals um, have a life cycle that they go through. And because of that, there's a seasonal risk to Lyme disease here in Vermont. So um, in winter here, it's obviously very cold. The ticks are largely dormant. In the spring, when it starts to warm up and it's no longer below, below freezing, nymphal ticks, small ticks, they're not full grown adults, but they're not babies, nymphal ticks come out and they become active, they're looking for food. In the summer, after a meal, those nymphal ticks will take their time to molt, so there'll be very little tick activity out in nature because they're spending their time growing. In the fall, just about right now, we're going to be getting here, those adult ticks become active and they try to get one before the winter sets in. And so when we look at this seasonal pattern here and we contrast it with what we see with Lyme disease cases, you can see that there's a very sharp spike in the number of Lyme disease cases at one particular time in Vermont. And that's really in June, July, and August. This is when most Vermonters are getting sick. It's important though to also note that people are getting sick in Vermont at any time of year. So while, while ticks might be dormant, largely dormant in the winter, if they, happen, if they happen to have a warm day, there's no reason why a tick who didn't get a blood meal when it wanted to when it was warmer out wouldn't try to come outside and get a blood meal then. So uh, while there's certainly a lot of activity for Lyme disease in the spring and summer, we do see cases um, at every time of the year. And if we actually look at when people are getting exposed to these ticks, so this is um, the green parts here are the number of um, Lyme disease cases and when people um, actually start getting sick in Vermont. If we contrast that with when people are actually going to the emergency rooms for tick-related visits, we see that it's actually a couple of weeks earlier to these ticks. So while most people are getting sick in June and July, we know now that the risk period is actually April and May. This is when those nymphal ticks are out, and this is when Vermonters at most are at most risk for getting exposed to Lyme disease. And one interesting thing to note is you see that there's this second spike in people visiting Vermont emergency rooms in the fall, but there's no subsequent spike in Lyme disease cases afterwards. So what we can infer from this is that the nymphal ticks that are active in the spring are very good at transmitting Lyme disease to people, but the adult ticks that are gonna be coming out in the next couple of weeks are not very good at it. In fact, they're much better at transmitting anaplasmosis. We see a, quite a number of cases of anaplasmosis occur in the fall. So the end of March through the beginning of June is really the risk period that we want people to know about here in Vermont. And as Dr. Budd was mentioning with the symptoms of Lyme disease, I won't go into great detail with that, but one thing, important thing to point out is we have this lag here between the peak in people because of ticks and people getting sick because there's an incubation period for Lyme disease. And it can be anywhere from three to 30 days. So if you remove that tick, we encourage people to be monitoring their health the month afterwards because it could take that long for any of your symptoms to appear. As for the symptoms that we see in Vermont, they're really not that, not that much different than what we would see nationally. Again, as Dr. Budd was pointing out, um, the erythema migrans rash is common. About 70% of the people in Vermont get that, but not everybody does. Um, I think it used to be a misconception that the EM rash was always, and if you didn't have an EM rash, 
he couldn't have time. We know that that's not the case. Um, some of the other symptoms, one thing that makes uh, diagnosis difficult and makes it difficult on people to know what they could potentially be dealing with is that these symptoms are vague. <coughs> joint swelling, fatigue, joint pain, fever, you know, these are generally called flu-like symptoms. And so it's very difficult to discern what is causing your illness if you don't have that EM rash or you don't have the available. Um, if there is a good thing about Lyme disease is that in its acute phase, it is not a very severe disease. Uh, Dr. Budd was mentioning some of the more serious uh, involvement that you can have, whether it be cardiac or neurological. Um, only 3% of the cases in Vermont were hospitalization for Lyme disease. Um, contrast that with anaplasmosis, where over a third of them do. And um, it's even higher for babesiosis. About half the people that get babesiosis in Vermont require hospitalization to get over their illness. Another important thing to note is who is at risk for Lyme disease in Vermont. So these are um, our age groups um, in five-year increments. And the important thing to see here is that um, across all age groups, we've got a healthy um, set of bars here. So the bottom line is that everybody in Vermont is at risk for Lyme disease. A couple of things we can pull out of this is that there appear to be some high risk. One, kids who are five to 15 years of age have Lyme disease in Vermont, and so do older adults who, um, in their 40s and upwards. In just about every age group here, you can also see the blue bars where This one? Got it. Okay. Good. Okay. So males are at greater risk than females for Lyme disease in Vermont. Those are the blue bars. And then, of course, we're all here tonight because this has become an increasing problem, not only in Vermont, but in the rest of the Northeast. In the 90s, when Lyme disease first became reportable in Vermont, we'd see a couple of cases a year. Um, but over time, there's been a steady increase. In 2008, you see that big jump. Uh, we started counting different cases, a different type of case that year. Um, but certainly, there's been a rise um, even without that new um, case definition. And again, this is something that is being seen in a lot of other uh, New England states. Um, and so from 2008 to 2016, um, again, we're counting cases all the same way, but it's a, almost a 90% increase. So we know that it's not simply surveillance that's pushing these numbers ahead. We're seeing, you know, ticks in parts of the state perhaps that we hadn't seen before or the pathogen is becoming more prevalent. In fact, this, these maps here are going to demonstrate that well. Um, on a county level in 2008, you could see the northern counties of Vermont are light green, uh, pretty small incidence of Lyme disease during that time. Bennington County was getting particularly hard hit and then Addison, Windsor and Rutland were um, sort of in the middle. If you fast forward to 2016, what you can see is that not only has um, the disease become more frequently occurring in southern Vermont, but it's also appeared to push northward as well. And so really the northeastern kingdom of Vermont is the only part of Vermont that's sort of the, the last unknown territory for um, Lyme and some of these other tick-borne diseases. Um, and we could spend a whole evening talking about the reasons for this, but I think one of the important ones to consider is that um, human habitat is tick habitat. You know, we like to live in homes that are surrounded by patches of woods and have got, um, you know, grass, or we live um, interspersed in farmland, and all of that provides really nice habitat for the white-footed mouse and these shrews and chipmunks. And so um, the development that we've done and the way that we've um, changed the landscape has probably contributed and is one of the contributors to why we're seeing so many more cases of Lyme and some of these other tick-borne diseases. Now I'm going to turn it over to Molly, who's going to talk about prevention.
Can people hear me? How does that sound? Okay. Um, my name is Molly Markowitz, and I am a, currently a fourth year medical student at University of Vermont. And I wanted to start out talking about how I got involved in Lyme disease education. So during my first year of medical school, I um, was involved in a program called Lyme Corps, which was a CDC-sponsored program. And it was a group of medical students, residents, public health students who came together to learn about Lyme disease with really the main focus and goal on prevention and educating our communities, both the general community as well as healthcare providers, um, and also emphasizing early detection of Lyme disease. I just wanted to include some pictures here of kind of some of the work that I've done um, and members of Lyme Corps have done. We wrote articles, we blog posts, um, there were research projects, all sorts of activities. We tried to engage communities both um, at farmers markets, things like that, to try and educate our community about Lyme disease. So in the spirit of Lyme Corps, I'm gonna talk about prevention today. And as you can imagine, one of the best ways to prevent getting Lyme disease is if you never get bitten by a tick. And so I'm gonna talk about all the ways that we can um, work to try and make sure that we don't get bitten by a tick and then don't get Lyme disease. So I divided this up into three main categories. First being avoid ticks. So the take home message is ticks love moist, warm environments. So if we want to avoid them, then we should avoid those areas. And of course we live in beautiful Vermont, so we can't not go outside and spend time outside. So when we are outside, it's important to think about avoiding the areas where ticks are. So that means when we're walking outside or hiking, we walk in the middle of trails and not walk in the grass or the brush or bushes where the ticks are hanging out. And like um, we talked about before where they're questing and trying to jump, or not jump, but um, <laughs> uh, attach to you as you walk by. Um, second is repel ticks. So we, um, the CDC recommends using DEET um, at either 20 to 30% to um, repel ticks. It's important to think about this because when you can actually buy DEET um, in the store that's at a lower percentage, but that isn't thought to necessarily repel the ticks. And you can use that both on your skin and your clothing. Um, also, you can use something called permethrin um, to treat both clothing, gears, and things like that when you're, that you're gonna be using outdoors. Um, so inevitably, you know, we're avoiding ticks, we're repelling ticks, but perhaps some of them are going to get on our bodies. So it's important to think about ways to remove them. And as we talked about, um, ticks, you know, once they get on your body, they're actually not going to attach and bite you right away. A lot of times they're going to move around your body, um, find some sort of little nook or cranny, maybe your armpit or behind your ear, or somewhere in your hair and attack. So that gives us an opportunity to remove the ticks before they have the time, the opportunity to bite us. Um, so the CDC recommends that you shower or bathe within two hours of spending time outdoors and hopefully then you're gonna wash the tick off. Um, additionally, it's really important to do what we call like a tick check. So that means you're going to inspect your body and look for a tick. Um, you're gonna inspect your pets, your gears, anything that was outside. And this can be um, kind of a challenging process. I wanted to emphasize really how small ticks are and really what you're looking for. So here I included this image because you can see a dime and then you can see in reference to that really how small ticks are. So the ticks that are gonna bite you are both the nymphs and the adult ticks. So really what you're looking for is something the size of a poppy seed or something in the case of a nymph and then um, something about the size of a sesame seed for the adult tick. So you're gonna have to look pretty carefully. So as you can imagine, this can be challenging, so it's really important to do those regular tick checks and make sure that you know, you're finding ticks that are on your body. Okay, so we've been talking about, um, you know, I wanted to include again the trend of how Lyme disease is definitely increasing both in Vermont as well as nationally, and so there, are currently lots of efforts to think of other ways of preventing Lyme disease, preventing tick bites. Um, 
So as part of Lime Corps, um, we wanted to think about contributing to that effort and coming up with an additional strategy to prevent uh, tick bites. So previously, the CDC had recommended on their website that after spending time outdoors, if you had an article of clothing or clothes that you were concerned might have a tick on them, to put those clothes in the dryer for one hour on high heat, and at the end of that time, any ticks that were on your clothing should be dead. However, one hour is kind of a long time. High heat is um, a lot for clothing. So we wanted to investigate kind of the full matrix of the different options you might have, washing, drying, detergent, dryer sheets, all of that, um, to see if we could come up with alternate ways to kill ticks on clothing. Oh, and a publication, as a result of our work, we were able to publish our publication in an academic journal and then actually update the CDC recommendations on their website. So one of the things that we found that it's actually a lot easier to kill ticks on clothing. So if your, tick, if your clothes are dry, so imagine maybe you have a blanket that you've laid out on the grass outside and you're concerned when you come inside that that blanket has ticks on it. And as long as it's not wet, if you just throw that blanket in the dryer on high heat for 10, ten minutes, that will kill any ticks on the blanket. Um, however, if the clothes or that blanket is damp, additional time is needed to kill the ticks just because ticks, as I said before, love moisture. Um, so that's um, why it may require longer time to really make sure that blanket or clothes are really dry to kill the ticks. Um, maybe the clothes or that blanket that you were using is dirty and you want to actually wash it first before you put it in the dryer. Then that's when you would, um, we recommend washing with hot water and then um, subsequently drying for a much longer time of 90, of 60 to 90 minutes depending on low or high heat. And that will really make sure that the clothes are dry and that you're actually killing the ticks um, on the clothing. And all of these recommendations are on the CDC website and you can find a link to the paper there if you wanted to read more about specifics. Um, I also wanted to talk about creating a tick safe yard. So this is really important. We all love spending time outside in our yards with children, pets, um, and there's some things that we can do to make sure that our yards are tick safe. So um, first, it's really important, important to avoid the warm, moist areas. So mowing your lawn, raking leaves, um, you know, keeping um, play sets, things like that out of the shade are really important to making sure that it's less likely that you're gonna encounter a tick there. Um, additionally, they talk about um, making a barrier between your yard and a tick habitat. And I have a picture here just to kind of visualize this. So if you put, a, studies have shown that if you put a three foot barrier of either like wood chips or gravel around between your yard and an area that might have a lot of ticks, like forest or a kind of bush area, um, that this can help prevent ticks coming into your yard and re reduce the risk of ex encountering a tick. Okay. Another um, way that we can prevent encountering a tick is thinking about our pets. Um, and this really interesting paper came out where they looked at simply owning a pet increased your risk of encountering a tick. So your pets are outside, in the yard, in the grass rolling around and they're going to get ticks on them and then they're going to come in the house and potentially have the ticks come, um, have the human encounter the ticks. So we can think about ways of preventing ticks getting on our pets as well. So just like we're going to check ourselves, we're going to check our pets regularly for ticks, um, you know, removing them promptly. Um, the tick safe yard is important to think about if our pets are spending time outside in our yard. And then also it's really important to talk to your vet about different strategies in terms of like repellents or pesticides that you can use to um, keep ticks off of your pet. So we mentioned briefly before about a Lyme disease vaccine. So there had previously been a Lyme disease vaccine available and some people did receive it. However, um, those people are probably no longer protected against Lyme disease because just like something like the flu vaccine that over time the protective value of it wears off. And so um, I just wanted to say, you know, stay tuned. There's um, 
more exciting information around this new vaccine coming out, um, which may be a really great new preventative strategy. Okay, so we've done all of these great measures to try and prevent getting bitten by a tick, but inevitably it will happen some of the time. Um, so I now wanted to talk about what can we do to prevent getting Lyme disease from that tick that's bitten us. So the important thing to do is to remove the tick as soon as possible. And the best way to do this is with tweezers. And I just included an image here for you to see. It's, you know, you grip the, tip for the tick firmly and pull straight out. Um, they, you know, they market things like tick scoopers and all sorts of different things, but really uh, tweezers work great. Um, cleaning the area, you want to clean the area afterwards. Um, it's not super important what you clean it with. Um, and then everybody wants to know, myself included, that when you get bitten by a tick, what are the chances are that I'm going to get Lyme disease or some other um, tick-borne illness for that matter. Um, and it really comes down to three big factors. One, the kind of tick that bit you. So if it was the black-legged tick, um, you know, that has the potential to carry Lyme disease. However, if it was a dog tick, then um, you know, the chance of getting Lyme disease is not possible. Um, in terms of also the location, so if you get bit by a tick in Vermont, as we learned earlier, there's about 50% of the ticks are infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, so that's a pretty good chance. Um, however, there's diff other parts of the U.S. if you were bitten by a tick, it would be much less likely. Um, and then additionally, we worry about the length of time that the tick had um, attached to you. So really it's thought that it takes at least 24 to 36 hours from when the tick bit you for that bacteria to actually get transmitted from the tick to um, you. So it's important just to remove the tick as soon as possible to make sure that you minimize the chance of that bacteria being transferred. Another really common question that comes up is when should we use prophylactic antibiotics? Um, you know, you've been bitten by a tick and you're worried, oh my gosh, am I gonna get Lyme disease? And the take home message is this is a great opportunity to reach out to your physician, to your primary care doctor, and to have a conversation with them about whether or not they think that that's the most appropriate decision right now. And I wanted to just include um, some of the criteria that they're going to use and think about when they decide whether or not they think you should have antibiotics. <coughs> so, um, first, they're going to think about the kind of tick that bit you. So, the black legged tick is the tick. Um, and then also the length of time that the tick was attached. And you can kind of use two things to think about that. One, you know, if you, when you were outside, so when could the tick have possibly gotten on you? And then two, the degree of engorgement. So I'll show a picture in a minute. You really can tell the difference between a tick that's just bitten you and a tick that's been on there for quite a few hours. Um, and then number two, um, giving prophylactic antibiotics only is found to be beneficial if it's given within 72 hours of the tick be having bitten you. So if you've removed the tick, you know, a week and a half ago, they don't believe that it's effective to give prophylact prophylactic antibiotics. So in that case, it would be appropriate to wait and watch and see if you develop symptoms. Um, then it also, one of the things they factor in is whether or not the ticks if there's a high likelihood that the tick was infected with the bacteria. And so just automatically being in Vermont qualifies you for number three, um, or many New England states for that matter. Um, and then doxycycline can't be contraindicated. So doxycycline is the antibiotics that we um, use for prophylaxis and to treat, um, oftentimes to treat Lyme disease. And so women who are pregnant, for instance, or children less than eight, um, usually do not um, give, you usually do not give them doxycycline. So in those cases, um, you wouldn't use prophylaxis. Um, but again, take home message is talk to your primary care doctor or your physician about this and they'll kind of work through the details. And then I wanted to include this picture here because it's a great visual to show what a tick looks like before it's fed at zero hours and then you know, if the tick looks like 72 or 96 hours quite engorged and large, you know that it's been there for a while. Am I back on? You can hear me in the back again. 
a little bit about what happens in the immune response in you. better? Is that better? Okay, I think we're back on. Um, and I know many of you in the audience are, are interested to know what we do know and what we don't know about what is chronic Lyme disease. Um, and so I'm going to give you my point of view of that tonight. And in thinking about that, um, the words of Donald Rumsfeld came back to me in thinking about <laughs> this. You know, the things we know we know, the things we know we don't know, and then worst of all, the things we don't know that we don't know. And I, as a scientist, strive for number one, but in reality, I live in the worlds of number two and number three. Um, we're living largely in the world of what we don't know, number one. And number two, despite our best efforts as good scientists, on most days, we're wrong. Most experiments don't work, okay? Nature holds her cards very close, and she gives them up very slowly. Um, but if you pursue it, Usually you can get some truth out of it and things gradually reveal themselves. But as Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, said, our research gives us knowledge that gives us ever-increasing sphere of ignorance. Um, <laughs> and I often feel this is what we face with all of our studies. But I'm going to tell you what I think we do know and, and some of the fringes of what we don't quite know yet about what's going on in us with this. Um, and there's various possibilities. I mean, that's what we scientists always think about what are the possibilities to explain what we're seeing. And I think all of these could be going on with Lyme disease. And so everyone's going to be different in what, what sort of response they may have. So we have the obvious possibility that with persistent symptoms, you may have persistent infection. That seems obvious, okay? But we certainly know in many instances with other infectious diseases that symptoms can persist even though the bug is long since gone. A very Classical examples of this are people that go traveling and get food poisoning with either salmonella or shigella, get diarrhea. Um, it clears, it's totally cleared from the GI tract, and then three months later, they suddenly get an arthritis. Okay, and there's no bug in them, but they get this, what we call reactive arthritis, very well described. Um, clearly implicated, the bug has induced this, but the bug's no longer present. So we know that there can be persistent symptoms even if the infection is no longer there. But I think we have to consider the possibility there could be persistent infection. Then there's the debris, okay? The, the particles of Borrelia, the proteins, are inflammatory, as I'll show you in a minute. It doesn't mean the bug has to be alive to cause this inflammation. It can have fallen apart in its DNA, its proteins can be still very inflammatory. And there's some evidence, at least in mice, that despite treatment with antibiotics, there can be this debris field in joints that lingers that can cause persistent inflammation. We'll talk about that. Then there's infection-induced autoimmunity, and we see this in various infectious diseases where you'll get a response to some part of the bug, and just by chance, your immune response to that bug happens to cross-react to a self protein, okay? And the whole process can be self-perpetuating. You don't need the bug anymore it can be self-perpetuating because now you're responding to some self-component. Um, and this has been shown in Borrelia too. Um, and there's genetic predisposition. People that get chronic Lyme arthritis have a genetic predisposition we know that looks not unlike rheumatoid arthritis. And I think there's a real clue there. I think each of those disorders is informing the other. For instance, we know for a long time in rheumatoid arthritis that people that get it have a high incidence of a transplantation antigen. These are the things that we use to match up kidneys so you don't reject them. So people have one of these, it's called DR4. The name's not important, but it's a particular immune response gene. Turns out people with chronic Lyme arthritis have a high incidence of the same molecule, saying to us that 
Whatever causes rheumatoid arthritis, it may initiate a process, and Borrelia is able to initiate that process as well. And ultimately, we may learn that there's 12 ways to initiate that process that we call chronic arthritis. In one case, we call it Lyme arthritis. In another case, we call it rheumatoid arthritis. But the final common pathway may be the same. And we now know there's another gene, and there's probably several more, called GUSB. This was actually one that Corey Tosher, a geneticist in our group, identified a couple years ago that has to do with the degradation of proteoglycans in your joint. So these are components of the joint matrix. And they showed that there was a defect in mice that predisposed them to Lyme arthritis. They didn't degrade these proteoglycans. And these proteoglycans, when they accumulate in joints, can be quite inflammatory. They trigger part of the immune system. And it turns out mice that have that defect are also very susceptible to the model for rheumatoid arthritis. So again, another parallel between these two diseases. So there's genetics behind this as well. Tissue damage can promote chronic inflammation. So bugs can damage our tissues, we know that. And then as I'll show you, it turns out the stuff that's released from our own cells can be very inflammatory and can take over the role of bugs. We don't know, we no longer need the bug. And finally, there's the residual effects of previous inflammation. I see patients all the time that have had previously active rheumatoid arthritis. It's now totally quiet, but they still have deformities. They have disabilities. They have symptoms, okay, even though there's no longer inflammation there. So we have to face the fact that some of these symptoms may be the damage has been done, period. And now we're dealing with the damaged tissue. Okay? So all of these are probably going on in us. And that's why we have to individualize each patient to the best of our ability to say which of these is going on in a given individual. So let's take a look at some real data. This is a study. There are several studies like this in the literature about the effects of antibiotics on chronic Lyme arthritis. So I'm going to draw upon arthritis. We could talk about the other chronic symptoms. This is what I tend to see as a rheumatologist, so I'm most familiar with it. And this study was done. It was reported in 2001 in the New England Journal. 115 patients who had chronic Lyme arthritis that were randomized to receive um, a month of intravenous ceftriaxone, two grams a day, and then two more months of oral doxycycline. So quite a long period of antibiotics versus the placebo. And here's the antibiotic group, and here's the placebo group. The percent that improved, unchanged, or worse. Okay? There is, there is no difference there. Now, that said, if you were to look at this a little bit further, you might find something like this an outlier, or maybe several outliers. In this, if you were to res graph here the response to antibiotics, oops, here, you'd say that most of the people didn't really have much response, but then there was someone, or a few people out here. Who are they? They clearly had a response. And you see this in just about any clinical trial you do, whether it's arthritis or asthma or various diseases. There's always the outliers, and they're very informative, okay? Did this person have persistent infection? We don't know. They clearly responded to the antibiotics. Um, and we need to know more about who are these outliers, okay? So we need to indiv individualize our approach to this. The problem with Borrelia is unlike many infections, there's not many bugs in us at any time with the infection. It's hard to detect. You know, you get Salmonella or Shigella or, or Staph, there's oodles of bugs in you. There's very easy to detect. Borrelia, it's very few bugs in us at any time, so it's difficult to prove that, but we have to consider it. Okay, regarding the immune response, we have two immune systems, basically, and both of these get activated by Borrelia, okay? We have a very old immune system we call the innate immune response. You can find evidence of this all the way back into insects. Even plants have similar defense mechanisms to this, okay? And it takes a very specific strategy. It takes a strategy, let's have a limited number of receptors that respond to a limited number of things that are common in bugs that are not common in us, okay? And we'll react to those things. Maybe it's 50, okay? And these have co-evolved over a long period of time, us and the bugs, so that they have a very high affinity. And that gives us speed. And so when you get an infection, like with the flu, and you begin to get the chills and the fever, it's your innate immune system that's kicking in. So it gives you lots of speed, but you don't get a broad repertoire. You're only 
responding to a limited number of things that you can see. Okay, in contrast to that is our newer adaptive immune response. So this you find only in vertebrates. And these are the things that perhaps most of us have more commonly heard about, antibodies. We make millions of different antibodies from our B cells. We have T cells that attack virally infected cells when the infection's inside a cell that antibodies can't get to too easily. And we make millions of different receptors to give us breadth. Okay, the downside of that is with any given infection, you've only got a few cells in your body that will respond to any one thing. So you get breath, but you, you don't get speed and you don't get high affinity interactions. So each has its advantage um, and both are going on in this with Borrelia. And I'll show you a little example of each of those. So here's a biopsy of someone with Lyme arthritis. These swirls of cells you see here are white blood cells. It includes those T cells and B cells that were in the previous cartoon. And here's a blow up of that. These are the cells invading cartilage in a joint, okay? You couldn't distinguish this from rheumatoid arthritis. It looks identical to this. And studies have looked at this. You really can't distinguish them. But we're very interested to know what do those, whose are those cells? What cells are there? What are they doing? Um, and so part of the research that we're doing right now is to isolate these cells from joints and do what we call single cell analysis. So we have the ability now to isolate these cells, put them in a machine we call a flow cytometer that will put one cell in one well. Okay, and we can collect hundreds of these cells. And then what you can do is extract from the nucleic acids, the DNA or the RNA, from each cell individually and run it through a process that will tell you what cell is it, what is it capable of producing, what genes are up or down, to give you a really idea of what's going on inside this joint. So this is research that we're doing now. As far as the innate, the old, immune system goes, <coughs> we have, we now know that we have a, a number of these receptors that respond to some of these conserved motifs I mentioned from bugs. And Borrelia has some of these. So for example, Borrelia has a lipopeptide that will bind to this thing called Toll Receptor 2. Um, it has a typical type of DNA that will bind to Toll Receptor 9. It has um, other lipopeptides that respond to told receptor one and two, and a flagellar protein as well, right here. So components of Borrelia will activate this innate immune system, okay? No surprise there, this is what bacteria do. And this is how these receptors have co-evolved over time to pick up these conserved motifs on bugs. Well, it turns out that we have residing in us old bacteria, okay? We call them mitochondria. Okay, you may have heard of them because they're the furnace of our cells. They make the ATP, the energy, that allows us to do the things we do, allows us to move around. Okay, they generate our energy. But what they really are, are old, old, old bacteria that we took into our cells a long time ago. And they brought with them all the components of bacteria. Their DNA is different from our DNA. Their outer coating proteins are different from ours. And so when these mitochondria fall apart, they release components that for all the world to the innate immune system looks like an attacking infection. And so we now know that this exists. And so when these mitochondria fall apart from tissue damage, they can cause inflammation. And you've all experienced this. We just didn't think about it. So you've all banged an elbow or a knee and it, what happens? It swells up, it gets warm, it gets red. Is it infected? Probably not. So what's going on, okay? That's, that's an inflammatory response. Something's causing that, and yet we don't think about it. We're just, it's so natural to us. So what's going on there is when you damage tissue by banging it, these components get released, okay? And they can cause chronic inflammation just from the tissue breakdown. So when you get an infection that also causes tissue breakdown, you run the risk of these things getting released, and once that happens, it can become potentially self-perpetuating and you may not need the inciting organism anymore, okay? So these are the things that we're contemplating right now and trying to figure out what's going on here. So all of these things could be going on in any one of us that gets Lyme disease to various extents, and that's why we have to personalize our medicine to figure out 
which of these categories is an individual in. And so with that, we're going to stop and take your questions um, to any of us. We're all up here. And I will also add that part of the research that we're doing has been done by my now retired technician, Karen Rossner, who's sitting right in the front row here, who's tonight. And when she retired, she was replaced by Cheryl Collins, who's sitting in the back there. And they'll be happy to take your questions. <laughs> <that> you <have. laughs> so thank you. We're all available to take them. so everybody can hear them because the acoustics aren't always so good. Please. First of all, thank you very much for being here. I enjoyed this and thank you for medical school for giving us on. Uh, I'd like you to comment on the uh, possibility of transferring Lyme disease from human to human, either through casual contact, exchange of bodily fluids, blood transfusion, things like that. So the question is, can, can you have human to human transmission? The answer is, um, I don't think there are any known cases that have documented that. And the probable reason is, as I alluded to, is that the, the burden of Borrelia in a human that has it is very low. Okay? It doesn't mean it's not causing inflammation. But you're hard pressed to find it if you biopsy about the only place you can really pick it up is if you biopsy that skin, that erythema migraine that I showed you earlier. In about 40% of cases, if you biopsy, you can see the Borrelia. But if you biopsy joints or other tissue with people you know have Lyme arthritis, it's very hard pressed, so it's a very low burden. So when the tick feeds on you, the chance of picking it up to transmit it, almost impossible. As opposed to the natural host that Bradley was talking about, that have a much higher burden. Go ahead, right there. So the question is, um, mother to infant transmission. Um, in theory, yeah, I think that would be very possible where you've got such intimate contact of the blood supplies there. Um, I think it's possible that there could be transmission there as well. The other thing is, since we know that our immune response can cause some of these symptoms too, it's possible that moms are also transmitting some of their immune products that we know goes on. And so it's possible that some of those in addition, could be causing symptoms. It's a theoretical possibility. I don't know that anyone's proven that, but we certainly know that those things get transmitted as well. Right, right. Yeah, we're going to repeat them all. So the question is sensitivity of, of testing, particularly urine tests. So there is another test I didn't mention, which is called the polymerase chain reaction, PCR for short. Um, some of you may have heard of this. This is a, a way of amplifying DNA. Um, crime labs use this all the time to amplify small quantities of DNA to figure out who's who. Um, and so you can pick up very minute quantities of foreign DNA, Borrelia DNA. Um, and so we've used that in samples of body fluids, so joint fluid. Does someone still have you know, persistent Borrelia? And sometimes you can pick that up. So, but you have to remember, what you're picking up is, is DNA. That doesn't equate to necessary live bug. You know, these bugs fall apart and they release their DNA. So the DNA may, may be there and it may be inflammatory. 
but it doesn't mean that you've got live infection going on, and you have to keep that in mind. Yeah, so again, this is can you change the mouse? So yeah, so they're trying to change the the mouse so its its environment is not hospitable to the Borrelia, or they get a more active immune response to it and clear it. I don't know, maybe Bradley, can you? Talk yeah, to that? so I'm familiar with that study, and no, we're not doing anything like that. That's that it's not happening just yet. In Nantucket, I know that the residents of the island are considering it. Um, it would be a great place to do it on an island where the you wouldn't have an influx of mice who didn't have that genetic modification. Um, so we're certainly keeping an eye on the results of that study, but we don't have any plans to initiate a study like that here. Again, the question is, how do you use the antibody titer to help you diagnostically? Is this, where are you in the course of the infection, right? So, as I mentioned earlier, we have, we have a variety of antibodies that we make that have different names, but the acute one is this one we call IgM, okay? And, and this is true of any infection. We get uh, mononucleosis or anything. We look for the IgM response. It's the first one that goes up, and it goes up fairly quickly, but also comes down fairly quickly as the next wave of antibodies take over the IgG antibodies. So one is, is this an IgM response, okay? And, and if not, if it's an IgG response, that can last for a long period of time, as you know, and so it doesn't tell you necessarily where in the course of the infection you are. So it could be early on, it could be very late. I, I will say this, it, it, it takes time to get even an IgM response. So someone could come in with symptoms if they happen to get a high burden or they're just very sensitive and had flu-like symptoms in early Lyme, and the antibody test is negative, okay? It, it has happened, and people can come in sometimes just too soon. They haven't mounted an antibody response. So if, if you're suspicious, it's well worth testing it again in a couple of weeks. In veterinary medicine, we have a test called, uh, I think it's called a C prime test. I don't know whether it's familiar, but Well, I'm wondering if this is similar to what I was describing. Is this distinguishing IgM from IgG antibody responses? Do you know? I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that veterinary I test. Think, I don't think that's exactly the case. Yet, but I, okay. Back row. I guess I don't know. As I said, I'm, I'm used to living in the world of I don't know <laughs> sometimes, so I'm not sure about that one. But as I said, we, what we typically do is the two-phase test. We do that here. If the ELISA is positive, we will automatically do the Western blot. And to me, that's the important one, is how many bands on the Western blot are positive, because the ELISA can be frequently a false positive test. Halfway up, right there in the novel. Yes, you. So I did wait and see, and two and a half weeks later, I was horrible. 
by the CDC wants to hold on to those terrible protocols of four weeks, I mean, and that terrible test where all, I'm sure there's so many of us in this room who are suffering and feel as though people in the medical community, who I'm sure everyone went into the medical medicine with a right reason, but we have to listen to so, so what the field really needs. <clears throat> and I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely with you on that. What we need diagnostically is a very good sensitive test. And there are companies that specialize in, in detecting rare things in blood. A lot of these are trying to detect rare tumors, you know, metastases or early blood tumors. Uh, and so they have these diagnostic things to pick up rare events in the blood. And I know this, these companies are, are directing this towards trying to pick up Borrelia in blood because, as I said, it's a very low burden in any of us that have active Lyme disease. Um, and so that's, that's a daunting task, but I know people are working on it. The field desperately needs that, okay? We need to find out who are these outliers, okay, so we can treat them. There was a comment, back row again. Follow up on that because I think she makes a good point, and I don't really feel like I got a straight answer. The ELISA test is okay. The Western blot's more definitive. However, we're stuck with the current CDC protocol. Her question was, why aren't we pursuing if people have a negative and they're still having clinical signs? Why aren't we pursuing the possibility of a Western blot? to really rule it out. And there is a good lab in California. Right. I will tell you to gen I genetics. Yeah. So, um, we have that. I mean, I, um, the, the Western blot, I mean, most studies have shown that if the ELISA is negative, the Western blot is probably going to be negative too. I think more importantly, more importantly is if there are ongoing symptoms is to repeat that, okay? And because you can, you can, and let me just finish because as I said earlier, you can test these at a point before people have even mounted an antibody response. Right, but with all due respect, I had a sister-in-law who had a negative ELISA and she pressed her doctor and the Western blot was positive and oh, she was in shock. And I just think that um, with clinical signs, why not? And furthermore, I know that today was Borrelia day, but there's additional bacterial infections that come with tick bites like Ehrlichia. I have Ehrlichia, I have Lyme, and I have Bartonella. We haven't even talked about Bartonella. And, and Babesia. And we know Babesia can be dangerous. So again, I just want everybody to know that there's additional information. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is, what do you do if people have persistent symptoms, but they don't, haven't responded to antibiotics, correct? Yeah. Right. So I'll speak from our experience with arthritis. So we begin to consider the scenario that I was mentioning is that could there have been damage done or things released during the infection phase that now makes us self-perpetuating, okay? So in the case of Lyme arthritis, where as I said, you can't distinguish it histologically from rheumatoid arthritis, we've used the same agents that we use to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And that can be very effective. So methotrexate, some of the biologics that we now have, um, can be very effective at that phase of the disease. I can't speak to the other symptoms as much. Maybe a similar thing will be true there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a neurologist, so I, I wouldn't want to generalize too much, but I certainly know in the case of arthritis that has been very effective. Gentleman with the beard back there. Uh,
So at the health department, we don't tell physicians how to treat their patients, how to diagnose them, or how to treat them. We get hundreds of reports, uh, laboratory reports from UVM, from Mayo, from IGENX, from other labs, and you know we don't distinguish between which laboratory is giving us the results. We just look at the results themselves. And so, um, you know, the the it's not the CDC protocol; it's the IDSA guidelines that are um, most physicians are adhering to that say you have to do the ELISA. And if it's positive, you move on to the Western blot. So that's something that's you know been upheld a number of times and is I think under current review right now. And so um, you know when those recommendations come out, we'll certainly take a look at them. But I get calls from patients like yourself or you know concerned family members all the time and. The state of Vermont does not steer people to one hospital or one particular laboratory or another. That is, you know, a decision between you and your physician as to how you're diagnosed and treated. That doesn't answer my question. Does it matter what the state is doing to stand up for citizens that are running into the community? Well, so... I, So we do. So what are you guys doing to educate Yeah, so the big the big thing we do is education for um, for the public and for providers. We're not um, the standard institution for uh, training uh, physicians. That would be medical schools, but we certainly recognize that the landscape for Lyme and other tick-borne diseases has changed here in the state and that providers might not be as familiar with it as they might be in, say, Connecticut or Massachusetts. And so we are trying to educate providers about, um, you know, the presence of these diseases and, um, you know, how they can be diagnosed and treated. I think, as I was saying, since we don't know particularly the neurologic aspects, what is going on in the chronic phase, I think we're open to all sorts of stories about this, and I think we should be very receptive to them. And so I'm, I think that information is very useful. Does anyone have any data on that? In the health department, I'd have to let Bradley answer that I don't know. Or does anyone know, is there a blog site that this gets posted at? I honestly don't know. Do we have time for more? More questions? Yeah. Right there on the black sweater, towards the back. Yes, oh. yeah. Okay. As a clinician, a patient presents with a, a joint effusion and they've had some fatigue, whether it's you know three months, six months, a year, is there any value or anything that, that if you aspirate that joint that's going to guide you to think more line versus some other type of rheumatologic or inflammatory disease? Um, and the other question is in terms of testing, um, what's the 
you know, what would you say would be the time frame to retest if their initial test was negative? You're sending them for a line fire. So for joint fluid, you can send that off for this PCR test that I mentioned earlier to see if there's Borrelia DNA in there. Okay, that may come back positive and say that at least Borrelia has been there. Again, it doesn't say you've got an active infection, um, but it does say there's Borrelia DNA there. When I find that, I think it's well worth considering another trial of antibiotics. Okay, with the caveat, as I said, that you may not have an active infection, and hence you may not get a, a response to a second round of antibiotics. But at least I think it gives you reason to, to, to try that. But then I think at the same time you have to consider the alternatives I was just mentioning earlier is the same things that we use in rheumatoid arthritis, which do work in those cases. In the green sweater. So clinical diagnosis, the early phases, as I mentioned, are very nonspecific. It's flu-like symptoms, fevers, aches, a lot of things cause that, right? So of all the things that can cause fever and aches and pains, what one are you going to decide to treat unless you have some more information? That's hard to do. Okay. Are you going to treat for flu or are you going to treat for a different bacterial infection? Okay, you really need something to di help you diagnose it. And so part of the problem, as I said, is because the burden's low, we don't have a good test to pick up the presence of the bug. That would help us enormously if we could do that. Or raging something else, that's the problem from a physician point of view, right? Viral will do, sure, it'll do that. No, there's no evidence to suggest that mosquitoes can transmit Lyme or any of these other tick-borne diseases that we've touched on tonight. So we are over time, but I will just say that, and you can email us, and we are pretty good at responding. The one good thing about the state of Vermont is that it's not an enormous bureaucracy, and so um, you, you will reach a human being um, through our public inbox, and this is something that you know the state of Vermont is very interested in and um, focused on. In fact, I came from a a meeting with a number of the leaders in the health department about this very issue before I got here. So um, whatever feedback you or others have, be very um, receptive and interested to hear it um, through our inbox. Thank you.